We get some lights up here. <laughs> Feels very dark. <laughs> That's better. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Social Machines 4, which is thankfully the last session of the day. It's been a long day already. Um, we have two final sessions uh, for today, and we're looking at sort of, uh, an hour for the first one, uh, maybe half an hour for the second, but lots of questions. Um, do feel free to come in and out. Um, we have, because there's no roaming mic, we have, we're thinking about trying, if you have questions, when there are questions, just queue up at the front and, and speak them into that mic, we'll, we'll see if that works. If it doesn't, then we'll just go back to uh, speakers parroting back what the questions were. So we'll give that a try and, and see if it works. So the uh, first speaker up for our final session of the day is uh, Jared Zimmerman, and he's going to be talking about uh, interface vision. Hey there. Um, so first I just wanted to say that if there's anything up here that you like, we'll try to get it rolled out within a month, a week, whatever. <laughs> if there's anything you don't like, you'll never see it. Don't worry. Um, so one of the main things that the design group really is focused on is, is translation, and not translation in the sense of oh, <laughs> uh, not translation in the sense of languages, but translation in the sense that um, users tell us concerns, they tell us problems. Um, and a lot of times people can't vocalize exactly what an issue is. Um, I don't like this, this doesn't function the way I expect it to, I want to do this and it does something else. Um, so our job is a translator. We take what people say, the literal words they say, um, and turn them into actionable things that we can have our amazing developers build. Um, a lot of times the tools of our translation are you know, crazy whiteboards, full of, of these meaningless boxes, um, giant walls of post-it notes, um, or these little diagrams that only, only we as UX designers seem to ever really understand. Um, <laughs> the, the three kind of things I wanted to focus on today, and there's probably more than three, but I'm gonna call them three things, um, are these things. So when, when users talk about their, their use of our products, um, it really comes to break down into these three big buckets. Um, and we can see them in different ways. Um, we can say, I don't have time to edit Wikipedia, which is something we hear a lot of when we ask, do you edit Wikipedia? I don't have time for that. I'm, you know, I'm a student, I'm a busy mother. Um, there's so many things that take up my day that I don't have time for this extra thing. So we, we think about that and we say like, what does that mean? What does it mean to say, I don't have time for this? Um, so we can think about the fact that maybe they think editing Wikipedia takes too much time. Maybe they think that there's nothing you can do on Wikipedia that only takes a second or two. Oh, that cursor, I was trying to move it, but it's actually on the screen. <laughs> um, but the thing is, we, we have time for other things. We have time for all these things that we think are important. Um, and maybe they are important. Um, 
But I think that's not the case. I think that there are times in our lives where we have nothing to do. And maybe this for you is, is something that, you know, it's just a quiet moment of contemplation. But for most people, we try to occupy every single second of our lives with some type of diversion. Um, and I think for us, for people in product and design um, at the foundation, we want to battle for that cognitive surplus that we see people using. So what we think it is about, actually, is, is not that there's nothing to do, but that we need to give you a better hint about what those tiny things are that can occupy these little minutes here and there, waiting for the bus, waiting for a download. You know, you're sitting, you just got back from lunch, and you're not ready to get back to work. Um, you know, we kind of want to take all of these little moments of your day, and, you know, sure, you can spend them on Facebook if you like, but we have other intentions. So. Um, what I'm going to show you guys today is a bunch of little tiny vignettes, um, little sketches. Some of them are real, some of them are completely made up for this talk. Um, but they hopefully will illustrate some of the things we're talking about um, at these different points. So this one right here, I have a laser pointer, um, <laughs> ties into Wikidata. So every Wikidata item ha has an interesting little description. They're very short, there's some rules around how you write them. Um, but right now those aren't surfaced on Wikipedia. So one of the ideas that we had was this super quick little way of someone doing a little micro contribution um, here visualized on mobile, uh, where they can take, you know, they read the article or they just know a little bit about the subject and just write this one tiny little sentence. Um, and then you can see right there an existing feature of showing the last editor to an article. Um, this is something that you can see I'm very interested in being a, I don't know, level eight user, super user on Foursquare is it's, it's, it's a dumb thing, like, people are saying, this isn't fun, this isn't a game. Um, but for me, like, improving this, this like, location information actually is kind of entertaining. And Foursquare's done an amazing job at making it so quick to do. I can knock out like a hundred of these in maybe five minutes. Um, you know, other people are on the same bandwagon, and I seem to spend the same amount of time here. Um, going through and saying, like, you know, is this place the same as this place? Yes, 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 no, no, no. Um, it doesn't feel like, when we think about Wikipedia, it doesn't feel like editing. It doesn't feel like writing. It doesn't feel like, um, you know, prose. Um, but it's still a contribution. Um, we want to take a lot of the learnings that we see elsewhere in the world um, and try to figure out great ways to bring some of those, we call them micro-contributions, into Wikipedia. One of the things we want to try early on um, is a location-based micro-contribution. So you see here, you know, you have an article about a place. Um, there's some question as to what it is. Um, if you read any of the Wikidata sessions earlier, you know that there's this concept that individual wikis tend to store locations separately. We'd love to have that being pulled from Wikidata. So one of our ideas is to take the idea that you create the location information on a local wiki, and then we can store it on a local wiki and also push it back to Wikidata. Um, so you see here, you know, the person can choose a location. It's great on mobile because you might actually be at that place, which is a, a great use of mobile. Um, or even say, like, this is not a place, and you stricken it from the database of, of questions like that. A lot of questions we have around, you know, people saying, like, I don't have time for Wikipedia, is they're saying that I don't have time to write an article. Because that's what they think contribution to Wikipedia is, writing an article. Um, so, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Um, instead of that, we're saying, you know, what if what you were saying is, I don't think that's true, or I doubt that. What if the contribution is allowing someone to be, you know, one of the fact checkers? Um, a, a way to get into this and say, without even being in an edit mode, I can go through and say, this piece, I question it. And then basically that creates a work queue for someone else to go and, and find more details about that. So the other thing that uh, when people say, you know, I don't have time for something, a lot of times it, it comes back to, like, they don't really know enough about something. They feel confident. Um, so right now, we're actually rolling out a few projects. And if you're familiar with beta features, you'll probably have seen this. Um, this shows um, article hover cards. Hover cards allow you to preview blue links that are on Wiki um, with an image and a snippet of text and the last edit date. So things like this, and then this is just a sketch for a future thing, um, a footer on articles that kind of explains further reading. Um, if you're familiar with sites like Medium um, or lots of other blogs, you're familiar with this kind of feature where we, we parse through and we try to find related content. Uh, people tend to go on these kind of tangents of reading a bunch of related content. 
So this, um, paired with things like cover cards, allows people to really explore, find related content, and really kind of find a thing that both interests them and that they feel confident in editing. So the next big thing is, I'm afraid I'll mess something up. Uh, and this is another pretty common refrain that we hear from people. Um, we, we were doing some user testing um, recently, and, and not only did we hear the phrase, um, I accidentally ended up in this mode where I saw all of the code. <laughs> they had internet edit mode. And we're like, you did it right. And they were freaked out. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing is, you know, they, it goes back to confidence, like I said before. You know, I'm afraid I'll mess something up. Uh, the fact that we don't have an environment where people feel safe to play. Um, so that's another thing we're, we're trying to tackle right now is the idea of safe to fail, safe to play. What kinds of things can we do that will allow someone to feel like it's not the end of the world that they mess up? Um, you know, one of them is a social thing, not having people yell at them. Um, but let's play a game real quick. Okay, so um, this is a really great article. I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's, it's nice. Uh, you could read this whole thing and you'd probably get some idea uh, about what this thing is. Um, or I could show you this, and, and you might know a little bit more about what this thing is, but what, what's, what's missing? Anyone? Ah, yes, exactly. So, um, if you've been to the eye doctor ever in your life, you've probably seen this thing, um, and then this thing, and then there's this thing, I don't know, in the US that eye doctors do. They say, better one, better two, <laughs> better one, better two. Okay, so we're gonna do this. As soon as the light comes up, just yell which one is better. That's what I thought. <laughs> so, um, that, that's great. I mean, like. <laughs> But I mean, like that feels weird, right? We don't we don't want this just to be this thing that kind of automatically edits Wikipedia. That doesn't really that doesn't have like the hand of the author. Like that's I think that's what we all have both kind of a, an interest in and also a fear of that it could just be this automated process run by bots or run by aggregate numbers of people. So if we step back and say, what if we get to an article um, that doesn't have a picture, but maybe it's on comments? Maybe we can say what just happened. Here is a game, and what happens here powers this. So this is the existing, for the most part, uh, visual editor image insertion dialog. But what if the order of these photos was actually powered by what you guys just did? By hundreds of thousands of people choosing the best photo of whatever. Um, so that's kind of one thing that we're hoping for. You know, it's safe to fail. Like, how many people you know, want to sit for hours and look at you know, probably beautiful pictures all over the world? Um, having that be a simple game, um, we think can be very powerful. So a lot of things we want to talk about are about photos. Photos feel pretty safe. Um, people you know, may be fearful of writing full articles or making major edits to existing articles, but pictures feel very safe. So we want to do a lot of things to, to take the process of adding photos and uploading photos and make that a lot simpler. So you see, this is a sketch of the update to the visual editor um, image dialog. Not only does it include you know, full photos that aren't cropped, it also includes a way to access images you've uploaded um, and upload images. So this is a great start, and it's moving in the right direction. But what we'd love to do is actually say, that cool photo you just took while you were in Africa on your desktop, let's just make you be able to drag it from your desktop directly to the computer. Um, so this is a sketch by one of uh, our designers who's working with the multimedia team of a way to kind of natively integrate something like the upload wizard directly into the page. So drag it, put the most basic details in, and if you actually aren't comfortable with all these, these kind of extra details about licensing and source attribution, we can actually put this thing in kind of this null mode where it's only visible to editors who might be able to help you out and add this. So this is an interesting graph I found. This is up to date. This is from, from Flickr. Um, so this is as of today, I guess. Um, I don't know what the time span is, but I think it's at least a year. Um, so this is the most popular, and I guess Flickr is probably one of the top three, five photo storage sites right now. Um, these are the cameras, cameras, that um, are uploading content to, to Flickr. 
So let's think about that. I mean, those are the cameras. And I, I don't have mine because it's distracting, but it's over there. Um, and it's something I have with me all the time. So dragging a file from your desktop to Wikipedia is great, but my photos aren't on my desktop. They're on my phone. They're in iCloud. They're already on Flickr. Um, so we just released this cool app for iOS and Android. So if you haven't downloaded, download it now in like 15 minutes. Um, but one of the cool things about having a native app is we can send you push notifications. And we promise not to send too many of them. But, um, but if I'm walking around town, suddenly I'm on a scavenger hunt. So now all these articles with no photos, suddenly my pocket vibrates. I walk around, I take a great picture with apparently the most popular phone on earth, which I happen to have as my own camera. And now I just became an editor. I became a contributor. So this is great. And you know, first we can say, like, if you think about the, the Wikidata games um, that I guess uh, Magnus made, they ran out of some of the work cues in like a second. And those games were things like determine the profession of someone or determine the gender of someone. They burned through work cues in like days. And this was thousands and thousands of items. So if this happened on a few thousand phones, you know, would we illustrate every single Wikipedia article in a week? Possibly. Um, so we have to start thinking of other cues. You know, things like, um, you know, like maybe trump someone else's photo, take a better photo of something else. Um, while we have, you know, the phone in your hand, we might as well engage you in other ways. Uh, make sure that your notifications are here. You know, you're sitting on the bus again and someone replied to you in your talk page. Um, you don't have to wait till you get home. It's there waiting for you. So, um, come on guys. <laughs> So I really needed that um, because one of the things that, that keeps people sticky and, and working on sites like ours, like community sites, is appreciation from other people. Um, we know from the analytics group can tell you that, that research studies um, have shown that, that this, this simple act of thanking someone is, is this powerful drug. It keeps people around. So the thanks feature rolled out, I guess, about a year or two years ago now. Um, and we want to keep extending it. Um, we want people to feel the reason uh, to stay with the site, to come back to the site. The growth team is doing some amazing uh, exploratory work right now, thinking about how to get people, you know, either via email, um, other means of, of saying, hey, you know, you made these edits to this page, and now thousands of people have benefited from your edits. Thousands of people have read what you wrote. So one of the things we're experimenting with now is a way of having anonymous readers be able to thank editors. Um, and because um, the term thank apocalypse has been thrown around um, as a, uh, a sequel to selfie apocalypse from a few years ago, uh, we want to make sure that we don't do things like that. And we want to have really smart ways of kind of rolling those thanks up into you know unified things so I don't come to my, my echo notification feed and see that like there's a thousand notifications from you know a thousand readers thanking me. While that would feel great, probably wouldn't be very helpful. So um, what we're thinking about also is here, you know, it really showing the idea of, of this is created by humans. We hear a lot of times like, oh you know do you edit Wikipedia? No that's that's not for me. That's that's someone else. Someone else like edits Wikipedia. And we're like no <laughs> no it's you. Um, so ways of, and these are just lots of different sketches of ways of showing, you know, who edits Wikipedia, who's who's monitoring this page. People say like, you know, what if I do vandalism? Is it going to stick? We're like, well, you know, probably not on this article, but you know, maybe on another one. Um, so so ways of surfacing, like right now we are doing this, and you can see this right now on the mobile web. Um, but ways of other showing, like you know, the the popularity of a page, how many people are, are editing and viewing really going one step further into kind of personalizing, you know, not only original authors, but uh, like the most uh, prolific authors, how many edits, how things have just grown and changed over time. That all kind of comes along with the idea of, of humanizing Wikipedia. Um, the idea that the people you interact with on Wikipedia are actual human beings, um, and that you should be nice the way you're nice in real life, hopefully be nice to people. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, 
you know, years ago it was proposed, uh, you know, profile pictures, that's another thing that there's actual research on showing that, that human faces, human forms remind people that, that this name they're interacting with is a person. And, and this person has interests. And this person, they, they interact with the site in ways that it's not this surface detail of what you put out in the world saying, this is what I'm interested in, is it builds something based on what you actually do. Um, and I don't have a screenshot of it, but what you probably saw uh, maybe six months ago was an experiment on mobile where we had these, these mobile profiles that are actually built dynamically with your edits. Um, and so this is an idea of what something like that could look like on desktop, of a profile built solely around what you're actually doing, not just who you say you are. Um, and then really taking that further and saying, you know, the idea that, you know, I can go to any page and actually see other humans and how they've interacted with that content. So, um, one last thing I want to talk about, um, you've probably heard about it. Um, I don't know if you have that in this country. Um, <laughs> it's a season. Um, so, so there's this thing called, there's this thing called winter. Um, and, and there's some things that winter is and some things that winter isn't. So winter is not a skin, it's not a product, it's not a feature. Uh, winter is a, a platform that the design team is using to experiment with lots of little changes um, that we may be rolling out um, at different time scales. If you're familiar with beta features, you'll probably recognize the compact personal bar. Um, that's a beta feature you can try right now. Um, I want to go through a few kind of the anatomy of, of winter and then Brandon after me is going to go and, and talk in detail about all the things. So the interesting things about winter um, is that you have a fixed search with a table of contents that's always visible no matter where you're on the page. Um, the compact personal bar, um, a right sidebar that has content that enriches the article and I'll go into that a little bit more, um, a, I don't know what we're calling this, uh, an article navigation bar. Uh, that tells you what mode you're in, what you're um, interacting with, whether you've actually watched the page or not, and then the actual content. So when you scroll the page, you can see that the header stays fixed. Uh, we clean up the, the margins. And what this allows us to do is do really interesting things uh, with that search bar. So we have some experiments around rich search that shows images, that shows snippets, um, that does best matching, and you see some of this already with the new search technology. It's not visualized like this, but the actual technology behind it is working. Um, and then we want to do what we've kind of been trying to do all this time, is highlight the amazing content by all the sister projects. So you can see here that we have results in other languages, we have results from commons, we have results from Wiktionary. Um, when you do a search on, on any of the sites, we want to make sure that we highlight the content from the site you're on, because you're there, but make sure that you know that there's all this amazing content from other sister sites. So then, um, as, as we say, you know, we, we design you know, mobile first, we design you know, X first, um, for all these different things, we want to make sure that you have the same amazing experience with search on mobile as well, um, but obviously mobile appropriate. So one of the other things um, that we're using the Winter platform to, to test out is some changes to info boxes. So as some of you may know and be frustrated with, Info boxes are actually make believe. Um, they're not real. Um, they're they're not a component in MediaWiki. They're some hacks and uh, and, and template text. Uh, so our experiments are, are things like trying to make these kind of rich module based info boxes. So this is one direction that we've thought about something that's content specific. Um, but the other direction is to kind of explode info box altogether and say as I'm reading show me relevant information that enriches my reading experience. So we can say, you know, there's a link right here um, for Wiktionary that talks about the origin of this word. And so we pull that in. I don't have to go to Wiktionary right now, I can go later. Um, this talks about the Mayan civilization. So I'm like, well, I, I, could, I could hover over that and I could see a, a hover card. Or maybe just as I'm reading that section, there's just this little blurb of, of enrichment. Or I go here, and I'm like, oh, that picture was really cool. Um, you know, show me other pictures from commons that are about the same category, or add my own. Another cool thing about Winter is it allows us to start playing with the idea of, of content language. So right now we have um, 380 sites that are all different sites. 
which if you ask someone who's not at this conference, they'll probably think we have one site with 380 languages. So what Winter allows us to start doing is playing with that kind of idea. What happens if you don't think you're going from site to site? What happens if you think you're just changing to the content language you want to read? So allowing us to start playing with the idea of, of making language be more prominent on the sites, individual sites. OK. So like I said, Brandon will talk a little more about Winter. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how, how this thing is going to get built. Um, so one of our designers, May, who if you were here a bit ago, you saw, um, has been working with the design team on something called Wikifont. Uh, and Wikifont is a standardized library of uh, characters that are delivered as a font, as a web font, uh, to users. It's going to be available to all of our developers internally and anyone that's developing on the platform. Um, it's, it's great for cross-browser, it's great for mobile. Um, it's really exciting that we're going to have this standardization across all of our sites for, for this iconography. It's part of a larger thing uh, called MediaWiki UI. The MediaWiki UI allows us to call standardized controls with the same look and feel all over the site. And we have um, a style guide that we're working on, which should be out within a month or two, um, that explains how to use them, how to call them, behaviors around how you should construct forms, um, and, and just basically how you use these. And you'll be able to simulate them on desktop and mobile as well. So one thing that allows us to do is some interesting things around standardizing UI. So on the top, you see what uh, the wiki text editor looks like in, uh, sorry, in, in winter. And then at the bottom, you see what visual editor looks like in winter. And there's not a lot of differences. And that's the goal. The goal is that you could seamlessly switch back and forth whenever you need to. And the back end of this is already rolling out. You can kind of sort of do this now. Um, and it'll only be getting better. We want you to be able to use whatever editor works best for you at any moment, back and forth. Um, and have a set of tools and interface that makes sense and is logical and doesn't change when you go from one to the other. So um, we love getting the unsolicited redesigns of Wikipedia. They're always exciting and entertaining and funny um, and inspiring and sometimes scary. I think they keep us on our toes, which is, which is great. Um, so this is my unsolicited redesign of Wikipedia. <laughs> um, taking in a lot of the things that we're working on in winter, um, a lot of the things that, that Brandon had worked on with uh, Agora, um, and really trying to think all the things that are important to Wikipedia, things like language, things like um, editing, um, which is something that a lot of the unsolicited redesigns seem to forget, um, and tries to bring those to the forefront with a great reading experience. So. The things that you know that we want to focus on, that we've been focusing on for the last year, and that we'll continue to focus on, is more contextual content, um, easy, impactful contributions that people feel like they can make in just a second, uh, more ways to contribute, you know, photos, small texts, ways of saying I think this is wrong, ways that people feel like they're not really super invested in, um, and other ways that they feel like they can fail fast and, and fail safely. Um, and then with with Winter, we're we're testing out this new responsive skin that's consistent across our platforms. Thank you guys, and thanks to my team. So I think we have some time for questions. So if you wanna yell them out or walk down here, whatever works best. Um, where, where are the diffs in winter? I can't see diffs from previous versions. If I go to history, I see no diffs. The uh, page diffs? I can answer that. Good. Uh, it's all pulled from the API. The API doesn't include diff information, so there's no way to go get it. Okay. Yeah, so so winter is definitely, it's, it's, it's a prototype. It's not a skin, so you can use it, uh, but it will not have all the functionality. doesn't do all the things you expect it to do, um, because it is a prototype and it is not a skin. We pull it from the API and visual editor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Good luck. Um, you can pull the diffs, but it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Next to the aisle there. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, how are now you said now you said that, uh, said that uh, users can do things so easily, and uh, I've uh, and uh, as I've already seen with the Wikipedia game, for example, it also leads to to more more errors and things like that. Sometimes even more, sometimes even more vandalism. Like, what if I, like, what if some some person, 
I mean, like the back page editors uh, make up a small proportion, but like, what if someone like uploaded uh, uploaded something really disgusting for the Eiffel Tower? I yeah. promise that happens every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm I'm very active on Wikidata, and uh, one of the Wikidata games, the merge game, was actually doing um it was actually doing art, uh, item merges the incorrect way. Um, and it caused a lot of problems for uh, Wikidata editors. Uh, the developers were really responsive. Um, they fixed the game, um, and you know things were fine. Um, we have to always balance these things. Uh, we can say, you know, uh, there was a thousand, there was a hundred thousand edits in a day, and you know, ten thousand were bad. And then two days before, there were ten thousand edits, and one thousand were bad. Like, did. Did we move the needle? Like, do we want more editors? Do we want more good edits? Do we want more bad edits? I think we always have to be, you know, looking at this, thinking about everything we do, and making sure that overall we're improving things and we're not putting the burden on our existing editors uh, to go up and clean up after all these micro edits that we're, we're thinking about rolling out. Okay. Wait, so, <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering, there was a session in here earlier that was about human-centered design and how it can be applied for uh, designing software and technologies around Wikipedia. So what I'm wondering is, uh, how, how does the design team take advantage of uh, human-centered design strategies and how do, you, how do you balance listening to your users with the designer's intuition? So um, one of the things that we've, we've recently done um, in the design group is we've hired um, Abby Ripstra, who is our lead user researcher. Um, she's uh, she's going to be building a, a team of her own within the UX group um, to do a lot of qualitative user research and work closely with the analytics group. Um, so what that what that gets us is not only the ability to go out and do exploratory research ahead of time to come up with the kind of problems we want to solve, it also allows us to evaluate our designs early on. So when we have something as, as simple as a paper prototype as simple as a bunch of concepts that we want to do a card sort for having people organize them into, con into con constructs that make sense for them. So I think the design team, as far as, as long as I've been here, I feel has actually been very um, you know, data inspired and research inspired in our designs. And so we have to balance that with, like you said, with, with our expertise and, and our understanding of design. Um, you know, everyone on the design team has years of experience um, and with experience comes the ability to, you know, to listen and to know when we're wrong. <laughs> Structure. Yeah, as we learned recently with the implementation of media, you were on English Wikipedia. Um, changes to the design tend to create pushback among established community members. How are mm -hmm. you guys planning on addressing that? We're going to murder people. <laughs> 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 no one will murder. <laughs> So um, I, I think the, you know, it's, you know, no one likes change for change's sake, not even us. Um, you know, I, I would say there's, there's nothing that we do um, on the site or in any of the products that's just on a whim to, to please ourselves. Um, we, everything we do is, is driven from some need by some set of users. And I think what happens in some cases is that um, you may not be the user that's driving that need. And you know we all have this this situation where we, as designers, we have to make sure we don't design for ourselves. Um, and I think as users, we have to be aware that there are other users that are not like ourselves. Um, and I think it's just it's just you know growing that awareness um, to say you know everyone's being listened to, um, but we have to just be aware that maybe that product is not for you.
Yeah. In Germany, here to finish that up, uh, we had a vote that finished yesterday against the media cure. I voted for the media cure, but many Thanks. people just don't understand that. Um, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, I think to, to answer that, it, the, the idea is that, you know, about a year ago now, uh, we rolled out the, the beta features framework, um, and the hope and the goal of that was to allow uh, people to play with and experiment with features far, far ahead of time of them being rolled out stable on the site. Um, we've been trying to have kind of almost like a six-month timeline, which, you know, for most companies, it's, it's a huge timeline <coughs> for rolling out a feature when we consider it, you know, almost done. Um, so I think, you know, there'll be, uh, there was a formation of the new community liaison group. Um, we've had community liaisons before, but now we have a, a structured group for that. I think with their help, um, working directly with product design, um, there'll be more messaging around new features. Uh, with beta features, uh, we're experimenting with echo notifications to make sure that even if you're one of those users, we know that on German Wikipedia, the beta link has been removed, so you have to go to preferences. Um, <laughs> So um, the idea of using you know, echo notifications to say, hey, there's a new beta feature, do you want to try it out? Um, and if you're one of those people who don't want to try it out, don't try it out. Um, but you know, that, that's the opportunity to, to, to converse with us, to, to give your feedback. Um, and a lot of times, you know, with any online community, no matter how much outreach you do, um, there's going to be an end people say, like, well, I, I didn't give my opinion, or I didn't get to talk. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're doing as, as well as we can, and we're going to be getting better and better and better. At, um, at making sure we get more feedback early on. Does that kind of answer your question? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's a, a. I think one of the other kind of little small nuggets of that was that you know it, it's you're saying like people are still editing Monobook and that's that's great. It's you know it's an open source project. Keep making Monobook better. Um, I think you know it's it's not going to harm anyone to make Monobook better. Um, you know, in about a month, um, there's a team getting together. Um, that's going to be working on, on, I'm probably going to say it right, but I think you're in the back there, Trevor, um, of kind of componentizing a skin so that it can be kind of, pieces can be called on a whim. Um, so hopefully that'll allow skin developers um, to build things that are more flexible, that maybe they want their own personal skin that is different and kind of cuts back all the, the stuff that they don't feel belongs to them. Change is hard. <laughs> Monobook is not an interface. <laughs> okay, I think I this is really important. I must say I admire all the others who can do the way to attract, if I understood well, an occasional editor. I mean, um, having a short time available and doing some editing is putting in the picture. Aren't you a little bit too optimistic there? I mean, is it really is the work like that? I think, uh, I think having editing my, done editing myself quite a lot, I must say that I, I really have to sit down, I have to do it carefully, and so on and so on. It never happened to me that even I corrected an occasional error I saw. I went to my computer, loaded it down, and then I made it, I made a session, and I corrected all of that error. So I think never anything occasionally, because this is prone to error. Sure. Um, there's kind of two schools of thought that um, people talk about. And one is that there are, what's the population of the earth right now? Seven billion. Seven billion. That there's seven billion possible editors right now, give or take a few billion. Um, and that the other is, um, is that there are, you know, 100,000. And we have to go find those 100,000. Or the other thought is that we can turn those seven billion into editors. And I, I don't think we have a strong opinion about which is true. Um, but our goal is to make it where you could accidentally contribute to Wikipedia. Um, I, I think you know your, your point is well taken that we have to think very critically about you know if an edit is too easy, is it too easy to make an, you know a bad edit? Um, but I, I think that that's something that will you know that is solvable. Um, I think when we when we kind of contemplate the idea of 
of taking aggregate edits, um, taking, you know, solving kind of the, the big data problem of looking at, you know, can we see that 100 people did the same thing? Um, you know, if you think about things like, you know, Cluebot, it's a, an amazing bot that runs on Wikipedia um, with something crazy like a, you know, 98 or higher percent uh, chance of finding bad edits. You know, we have technology that can, can help us with those bad edits. Um, so I, I personally don't think that there's, there's, you know, so many negatives against making edits easier that that should dissuade us. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, there's a there's an interesting um, idea called um, valid peripheral participatory participation or something along those lines. Um, and the the way that it was described to me was um, we're we're in the UK, so I'll say there was a uh, football um, a, a, a young a young child who liked football, and so as as a as a small child they had a, a favorite football player and they had a poster in their room. And so that was their first way of participating in football. And so they grew up a bit and they joined, I don't know, Football Little League, whatever you call that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, then they were, they were playing the sport at that point. Um, and, you know, they looked up to other people and, you know, they, you know, they were on a team and suddenly, like, let's say they're in college and now they're, they're going to college and they have a scholarship for that. Do they have that here? Um, and then they, you know, they become professional at this. Um, so every step of the way, from having a poster to having a favorite football player, that was participation in football. And so when we look at Wikipedia, right now we say, what is participation? And I think for a lot of people, participation means writing or creating articles or making major edits. Um, and then you know, it can start to expand from there. But how can we say, what else is valid participation? What if only thing I ever do is say that one photo is better than another? And I think we have to kind of open our minds to say what is valid and what is helping the project. And I think all these things help the project. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, it seems to me in your presentation, with micro contributions, that actually identifying what task could be broken down into a, a smaller contribution is part of it. Do you have any more ideas of? what those might be and how we might be able to identify them. Yes, we have lots. Um, if you actually go on MediaWiki and search for micro contributions, you'll find an entire project page where people have been collecting ideas. Um, and feel free to add your own. Um, we, we have um, one interesting one around disambiguation. It's something that you know computers are pretty bad at and humans are really great at. Um, so just a micro contribution. Should this be pointed here or here? Yes, no, maybe. Um, so yeah, we have tons of them. And um, we just, we'd love to expand that list. I think that one way of thinking is it's saying the same user that writes and edits articles now will be the user that benefits most from these micro contributions. And I honestly, uh, I don't know that my viewpoint is shared by everyone, but I honestly don't think that's the, that's the case. I think that there's going to be some users that gravitate towards certain types of contributions and others that graduate, gravitate toward others. 
So I think that we're not taking away from editors that are, are doing lots of writing. Um, we're just adding new ways to contribute for people that aren't currently contributing. Um, I think your example of, of someone kind of trumping a photo and saying this is better, um, you know, it, it's in the end, you know, there are there are ways to say, you know, this photo is sharper. This photo contains the entire subject matter. There are objective measures of something being better or worse, but you know, it, it's it's also subjective. Um, but the same could be said of writing. My sentence is subjectively better than your sentence. So I don't think it's a new problem. It's a personal style. Of course. Yeah. Um, what's the distinction between winter being a skin or not a skin or a platform or etc.? Are we saying then that it is likely to I'm actually down in gonna skin? let you re-ask that with Brandon. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Was there another one right there? What, what's the difference to uh, The difference is the crowd of editors doesn't fall. So the question is, what is the, the future of the community tools? Discussions, votings, uh, requests for deletion. About project, 30 minutes ago, there was a really cool talk here about Flow, which is the discussion system. That okay, the flow is how many years old? How many years old? Um, so, so first first on it during last yeah. 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 No, so, 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 uh, oh, like discuss a micro contribution? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, this doesn't necessarily propose that that would be any different than it is now, except for the addition of Flow, which makes actually having discussions on Wikipedia not impossible. Uh, um, Sure. I mean, I would say everything in Wikipedia is, but yes. The idea is to apply the instruments uh, that can uh, that can uh, distinguish good contributions from bad contributions by the statistics. Mm -hmm. So uh, do not consider single click as edit, but consider it as part of edit. So if several users uh, make the same big contribution. Only in this case, applied to the view. Yeah, and that's that's what I was saying to the other question. Um, you know, we feel that there's probably going to be a spectrum of micro contributions. Some will be um, exactly equivalent to an edit. Now, um, you hit, you know, whatever the action is, you've saved it, it's done. Um, and other on the further spectrum of micro contributions, we can think about things uh, working in aggregate. Um, things like the the photo rating that you guys did, just did. We can say that. They are themselves an edit, but that edit is not visible on the on the site immediately. They're improving a database, and that database is shown later to other editors. So I think a lot of these contributions are going to fall along the spectrum of some of them are going to function as individual edits, and some of them are going to function as improving a database or being aggregated together before an edit is made. Does that answer the question? Thank you for the talk. Very interesting. What's the best way that academic researchers and the community at large can feed into the design process? That is a great question. Um, ask probably, <laughs> probably, uh, probably our talk page. Um, there's a design research talk page. That's a sub page of the design talk page. Um, so uh, I, I would say you know talk directly to the researchers. Um, you know they're going to be. I, I would say they're going to be our main channel for having academic research kind of feed into what we're doing. Um, and Abby will be working to, you know, directly with our analytics team as well as, you know, external researchers to, to help us, you know, get the best learnings from what's going on in the world um, in forming our design process. And Abby's right here. This is Abby. <laughs> Red hair, glasses, back of the room. <laughs> Good.
Okay, yep, yeah, there you go. Sorry, it's bright. How, how do you deal with the challenge of designing holistically? I mean, you, you could take 15 or, or 20 uh, features or interface elements and A-B test them and find that if, if you put all, all the answers to those tests together, it's actually not the optimal combination. So we did this experiment where we had 100,000 shades of blue. No. <laughs> That's a different company, sorry. Um, so, uh, so we do, we do some testing, and with uh, the, the forming of the, the design research group, we'll be doing a lot more. Um, and like I said, we do this uh, all the way through the process. Um, we do it from you know, concept to paper prototypes to just us writing about things. Um, and then you know, when we can, uh, some of the designers will build uh, prototypes that we can test with users, um, and we'll test like vastly different ideas. Um, Pow Jenner, one of our, our designers, um, is working on a content translation tool, and he had you know some kind of very different ways that users can interact with it, and did a, um, a bunch of user testing around that, um, and then you know that informed his design um, that was shown to the engineers, to the product people in that group um, to help them make those decisions. Um, you know we. We want to later balance the idea of using both quantitative and qualitative research to really, you know, kind of iteratively make designs better. Um, but because of the size of our organization and our design team and our research team, um, you know, we have to kind of decide when enough is enough and we have to move forward with something, knowing that we can always change it later. Um, but you know, you can be paralyzed by by choice um, and just you kind know, of keep iterating on something and never actually build something. So that's that's one of our biggest challenges. I think Stephen Walling either wants to ask a question or add something. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add on that. Like, gen generally speaking, the foundation does an A-B test in the kind of manner of like a big multi-year A-B test where we test 10 versions of something, and each one has like a different button. But like, generally, like, we just don't have time to kind of do that kind of thing. Generally speaking, we're testing to see if the new interface probably didn't cause an effect at all. You know, you know, on the first time, you know, side of the thing, you know, on the next day. So we don't, we don't really test the kind of like regular so yeah, I would say that um, in addition to what Stephen said, you know, it's like we we do that, um, but not at the scale um, that a lot of other companies are able to do. And you know, we'd love to think of kind of cheap ways of doing that better. And you know, we're always coming up with new ways too. Anything else? Oh, sorry, I can't see. Yeah. My, my reaction regarding the these interface uh, improvements or changes is that it makes teaching Wikipedia harder. I'm oh, sorry, say again? Yeah. It makes teaching Wikipedia harder. For example, oh, teaching, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. For example, uh, I thought the idea of uh, the visual editor was a good idea. It makes editing easier. But actually, when it comes to teaching people how to edit, uh, the teacher or the lecturer has to learn a new interface in order to properly teach uh, the participants how to use uh, how to edit Wikipedia. <coughs> I think my, my uh, concern is uh, adding new interfaces in addition to the existing, existing interfaces may it will make yeah, teaching Wikipedia harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And um, it, before, before joining the foundation, um, I worked at uh, a company called Autodesk, which makes um, a piece of software called AutoCAD. And it's, uh, AutoCAD is an extremely complex piece of software um, <coughs> that sometimes people go to, to school for years to learn. Um, and, and every year, we would make the software easier. Um, it would still do the same things. It would still be just as powerful, but it would be easier to use. It would be easier to learn. And, and we had this interesting um, feedback from a lot of our users, especially teachers, people who wrote books, people who taught classes, um, that there, there was this hostility around you've, you've begun to invalidate what I've done. You've invalidated the fact that I spent you know, 10 years learning this, the fact that I spent a year writing a book about this, and now you've changed it. Now you've, you've kind of, they feel like you're slowly making their job unnecessary. And uh, I, think, I don't have a great answer for it. I, I would say that yes, we do want to make their job unnecessary. We want to make it something you don't have to have a teacher to learn to do. Uh, we want it to be something as simple um, as a game. We want you to be able to feel confident that you can do it without seeking someone out 
but we also want to make sure that there are those people that you can seek out and make it easier for them to help you if you ask for help. So. about flow specifically? Oh, uh, I mean, you, <laughs> uh, we, like I said, we've been rolling out beta features and one of the other places you can test out flow is most beta feature talk pages are flow enabled right now. So you can actually see some real conversations happening about beta features. Um, if you go to the compact personal bar beta feature in the talk page there, you can see flow in action. Um, you know, I have, you know, three, four, five jobs at the foundation and, you know, when I'm, PMing a beta feature in addition to everything else I do, um, you know, I, I was I was doing that for um, a, a feature that was using a talk page, and I was using it for a feature that was using a flow enabled page. And the amount of time spent for me to interact with the flow enabled project was a fraction of the amount of time it took me to enable with the talk page, um, enable talk, well, the wiki text talk page. Um, so I I love it. Um, I think it's got a lot of room to grow. Um, I think it's, uh, it's not perfect, um, but I think it's in the right direction. And I think um, you know, we have had comments from people interacting and giving feedback on beta features who have never talked on a talk page before. Um, and so we, we know it's working in that regard. We know that people who are n uncomfortable with talk pages or uncomfortable with Wikitext can interact on flow pages where they haven't been able to on talk pages. And that's that, that's frustrating. I know. I went to um, I went into a small editathon um, with a bunch of new users, and uh, and one of the things that that someone was saying is like, you know, you translated this article from another language, and so you should go and insert this translation template to say what the source language was. Um, and they tried to do it in Visual Editor, and and there was kind of a stumbling block. It, it, it might have been that it wasn't possible. It might have been they they just didn't know how to do it. Um, and so they had to switch to Wikitext to kind of finish the lesson. Um, and I, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's friction anytime things are changing, um, and and that's it's. I think it's probably just inevitable that that happens. Um, but hopefully, you know, the end uh, will make it worth it. So I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. I think uh, this is also due to a paradigm shift in the design software development in the last decade. I think uh, before you had big books telling you the exact way to do something. And nowadays, uh, you have more the paradigm. There are many ways to the same solution. And it's important that you are always enabled to uh, shift between the ways. And that's what happened in the visual editor in the first version. It wasn't possible that. Uh, yeah, and that's, like I said, that's that's being worked on now. It's, it's already vastly improved the ability to kind of seamlessly switch back and forth and, and will continue to improve. So many ways aren't bad. Yeah, yeah, no, no, of course. More time to teach both ways. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any hands, and we're out of time. Thank you, everybody.
Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Moeller. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that I don't really care what you do anymore. We're going to just do what we want. Now, um, hello. Uh, in 2012, Wikimania, uh, Washington, D.C., I gave a talk called The Athena Project, Wikipedia in the year 2015, which was intended as a uh, sort of, a, I believe that I said at the time, a kick in the head. Uh, because we wanted to break out of some boxes that we'd sort of walked ourselves into over the course of 10 years of, of design and, and uh, failure to design. Uh, so uh, it just seemed natural and right that I would uh, go ahead this year and give you an update and talk about where we are uh, in relation to that original thought process and road plan. Uh, and at the time, 2015 seemed very ambitious and it still is. Here's the deal, Jared pretty much gave my talk already so I'm just going to burn through these slides, and then we'll just start talking in questions. Uh, where are we? So first off, more Kirk, less Spock. This has been and will remain my design principle. Correct. <laughs> so this is now Agora, Athena, Echo, Flow, and Global Profile. If you see something here, unless I say otherwise, you should assume that it's not final. But guess what? Spoiler, there's final designs. So we'll start with Agora. In 2012, this is really just not the best way to do this. Um, in 2012, we described Agora as a design guide. We were gonna just talk about standardizing our visual principles across all the things. And we were gonna actually do, you know, real design. Uh, so, uh, with data driven. So we had uh, moved into 2014, and guess what? It's exactly the same. Uh, we're almost there. We're working on style guides. But as far as Agora as a project goes, nothing has changed. The timeline still stands. You can go and play with it right now, right there. Uh, these slides will be up later someplace. Any anyway, rate, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Athena, 2012. <laughs> I told you, I'm going to go through fast. Uh, we're going to rethink the interface. We're going to fix some basic flaws that have been there from the very beginning. For example, the uh, distinction between the content and the actions about the content being completely separated visually. Uh, users being trained to ignore anything outside of the content box, which is where all the magic stuff happened, uh, and that we were going to attempt to modernize. Uh, and this is what it looked like at the time. This was a, a concept uh, that we were working on, me and, and Kyle Jenner at the time. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Didn't quite work out that way. Uh, we no longer have Athena, we have Winter. And we're gonna talk all about that. Guess what, same thing. This is Winter, same word. We'll talk about that, that's where we're going. 2014, Winter, here's some links, fun. Echo and Flow. Nah, somebody gets this joke. Uh, Echo and Flow, in 2012, Echo and Flow, the design of Echo was about global cross-wiki notifications. Um, and we had some really ambitious ideas for what this was gonna be. Echo was and remains one of the fundamental underpinnings of the architecture for our, for our systems. Uh, unfortunately, you know, here's what it looked like then. Those are just some ideas. Unfortunately, we didn't get there. So uh, the global cross-wiki thing, which was near and dear to my heart, did not make it through the product cycle. Uh, and so at this point, Echo is still just local wiki. Um, that's a, kind of a sad thing, but hopefully we're gonna fix that, especially since Flow is already cross wiki. Um, bet you didn't know that. Uh, we didn't get it built for publications. Um, we sort of needed to like build another extension that was gonna specifically like write these, these notifications. That hadn't happened yet. Uh, and it, it, it might, it's just by 2015, it's just not there yet. This is what Echo looks like today. It's real. You've clearly seen it. Let's move on. Flow in 2012. This is what it was. Structured user to user messaging. We're going to get rid of talk page problems, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in 2012, uh, this should say, you know, still 2012, I'm sorry, my slides. Uh, sortable, freshness indicators, all sorts and kinds of other things along those lines. This was sort of the idea. Notice the avatars that everybody hates. We love putting that in there, by the way, because it like gets you to focus 
on something that we don't care about as much. Uh, so that you, you miss all the other cool stuff that we can do, you know, while you're complaining about that. <laughs> Misdirection is the, the best thing. In 2012, we are on target. Uh, it, actually, flow got a lot bigger between 2012 and 2013. Uh, there was a whole thing, that was my entire focus for like a year. Uh, we have a lots of experimental. There's a lot of stuff that is interesting and true. For example, it is cross wiki on day zero. Uh, you just don't see it because it's only on like one wiki. So it, that doesn't, I mean, it's kind of a problem. Uh, we will at the end of the year have sortable conversations about all this other stuff. The only thing that's missing is that little thing at the bottom that we distracted you with, the avatars. Yeah. There you go. Here's what Flow looks like today. You know, everyone on the design team has years of experience. Um, and with experience comes the ability to, you know, to listen and to know when we're wrong. <laughs> Striped shirt. You know, it's you know, no one likes change for change's sake. Not even us. Um, you know, I, I would say there's there's nothing that we do um, on the site or in any of the products that's just on a whim to, to please ourselves. Um, we everything we do is is driven from some need by some set of users. And I think what happens in some cases is that um, you may not be the user that's driving that need. And you know we all have this this situation where we, as designers, we have to make sure we don't design for ourselves. Um, and I think as users, we have to be aware that there are other users that are not like ourselves. Um, and I think it's just it's just you know growing that awareness um, to say you know everyone's being listened to, um, but we have to just be aware that maybe that product is not for you. So I, I think, yeah, I think to, to answer that, it, the, the idea is that, you know, about a year ago now, uh, we rolled out the, the beta features framework. Um, and the hope and the goal of that was to allow uh, people to play with and experiment with features far, far ahead of time of the main rolled out stable on the site. Um, we've been trying to have kind of almost like a six month timeline, which, you know, for most companies, it's, it's a huge timeline <coughs> for rolling out a feature when we consider it, you know, almost done. Um, so I think you know there'll be uh, there was a formation of the new community liaison group. Um, we've had community liaisons before, but now we have a, a structured group for that. I think with their help, um, working directly with product and design, um, there'll be more messaging around new features. Uh, with beta features, uh, we're experimenting with echo notifications to make sure that even if you're one of those users, we know that on German Wikipedia the beta link has been removed, so you have to go to preferences. Um, <laughs> So um, the idea of using you know, echo notifications to say, hey, there's a new beta feature, do you want to try it out? Um, and if you're one of those people who don't want to try it out, don't try it out. Um, but you know, that, that's the opportunity to, to, to converse with us, to, to give your feedback. Um, and a lot of times, you know, with any online community, no matter how much outreach you do, um, there's going to be, in the end, people say, like, well, I, I didn't give my opinion, or I didn't get to talk. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're doing as, as well as we can, and we're going to be getting better and better and better. At, um, at making sure we get more feedback early on. Does that kind of answer your question? Kind of. Uh, 
I mean, it's a, a. I think one of the other kind of little small nuggets of that was that you know it, it's you're saying like people are still editing Monobook, and that's that's great. It's you know it's an open source project. Keep making Monobook better. Um, I think you know it's it's not going to harm anyone to make Monobook better. Um, you know, in about a month, um, there's a team getting together um, that's going to be working on on. I'm probably going to say it right, but I think you're in the back there, Trevor. Um, of kind of componentizing a skin so that it can be kind of pieces can be called on a whim. Um, so hopefully that'll allow skin developers um, to build things that are more flexible, that maybe they want their own personal skin that is different and kind of cuts back all the, the stuff that they don't feel belongs to them. Change is hard. <laughs> Model book is not an interface. <laughs> okay, I think I I must say I admire all the others the way to attract, if I understood well, an occasional editor. I mean um, having a short time available and doing some editing even putting in the picture. Aren't you a little bit too optimistic there? I mean, is it really is the work like that? I think, uh, I think, I mean, editing my, done editing myself quite a lot. I must say that I, I really have to sit down, I have to do it carefully, and so on and so on. It never happened to me that even I corrected an occasional error I saw. I went to my computer, noted it down, and then I made it, I made a session, and I corrected all of that error. So I think never anything occasionally, because this is prone to error. Sure. Um, there's kind of two schools of thought that um, people talk about. And one is that there are, what's the population of the earth right now? Seven billion. Seven billion. That there's seven billion possible editors right now, give or take a few billion. Um, and that the other is, um, is that there are, you know, a hundred thousand. And we have to go find those hundred thousand. Or the other thought is that we could turn those seven billion into editors. And I, I don't think we have a strong opinion about which is true. Um, but our goal is to make it where you could accidentally contribute to Wikipedia. Um, I, I think you know your, your point is well taken that we have to think very critically about you know if an edit is too easy, is it too easy to make an, you know a bad edit? Um, but I, I think that that's something that will you know that is solvable. Um, I think when we when we kind of contemplate the idea of of taking aggregate edits. Um, taking, you know, solving kind of the, the big data problem of looking at, you know, can we see that 100 people did the same thing? Um, you know, if you think about things like, you know, Cluebot, it's a, an amazing bot that runs on Wikipedia um, with something crazy like a, you know, 98 or higher percent uh, chance of finding bad edits. You know, we have technology that can, can help us with those bad edits. Um, so I, I personally don't think that there's, there's you know, so many negatives against making edits easier that that should dissuade us. Well, as someone who's felt excluded out of the editing club, I think this is a great idea because it can get an occasional editor a little more confidence. And we have to remember that we were all occasional editors at one point. And by being accepted and learning from good things and from bad mistakes, we became better editors. And I think we need more new editors to come in because of gender gaps, age gaps, cultural gaps. And this is a great gateway to try to reach those people. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting um, idea called um, valid peripheral participatory participation or something along those lines um, and the the way that it was described to me was um, we're we're in the UK so I'll say there was a uh, football um, a, a, a young a young child who liked football 
And so as, as, a, as a small child, they had a, a favorite football player and they had a poster in their room. And so that was their first way of participating in football. And so they grew up a bit and they joined, I don't know, football little league, whatever you call that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, then they were, they were playing the sport at that point. Um, and, you know, they looked up to other people and, you know, they, you know, they were on a team and suddenly, like, let's say they're in college and now they're, they're going to college and they have a scholarship for that. Do they have that here? Um, and then they, you know, they become professional at this. Um, so every step of the way, from having a poster to having a favorite football player, that was participation in football. And so when we look at Wikipedia, right now we say, what is participation? And I think for a lot of people, participation means writing or creating articles or making major edits. Um, and then you know it can start to expand from there. But how can we say, what else is valid participation? What if only thing I ever do is say that one photo is better than another. And I think we have to kind of open our minds to say what is valid and what is helping the project. And I think all these things help the project. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, it seems to me in your presentation, with micro contributions, that actually identifying what tasks could be broken down into a, a smaller contribution is positive. Do you have any more ideas of? what those might be and how we might be able to identify them. Yes, we have lots. Um, if you actually go on MediaWiki and search for micro contributions, you'll find an entire project page where people have been collecting ideas. Um, and feel free to add your own. Um, we, we have um, one interesting one around disambiguation. It's something that you know computers are pretty bad at and humans are really great at. Um, so just a micro contribution. Should this be pointed here or here? Yes, no, maybe. Um, so yeah, we have tons of them. And um, we just, we'd love to expand that list. I think that one way of thinking is it's saying the same user that writes and edit articles now will be the user that benefits most from these micro contributions. And I honestly, I don't know that my viewpoint is shared by everyone, but I honestly don't think that's the, that's the case. I think that there's going to be some users that gravitate towards certain types of contributions and others that graduate, gravitate toward others. So I think that we're not taking away from editors that are, are doing lots of writing. Um, we're just adding new ways to contribute for people that aren't currently contributing. Um, I think your example of, of someone kind of trumping a photo and saying this is better, um, you know, it, it's in the end, you know, there are, there are ways to say, you know, this photo is sharper. This photo contains the entire subject matter. There are objective measures of something being better or worse, but you know, it, it's, it's also subjective. Um, but the same could be said of writing. My sentence is subjectively better than your sentence. So, I don't think it's a new problem. It's a personal style. Yeah. Um, what's the distinction between winter being a skin or not a skin or a platform or etc.? Are we saying then that it is likely to I'm be actually going to let you re-ask that with Brandon. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Was there another one right there? We are moving from the community of editors to the crowd of editors. What, what's the difference here? Uh, the difference is the crowd of editors doesn't work. So the question is, what is the, the future of the community tools? Discussions, votings, uh, requests for deletion. About projects, 30 minutes ago, there was a really cool talk here about Flow, which is the discussion system that okay, the flow is how many years old? How many years old? Yeah. Um, so, 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 so
So most people, you know, that's liquid threads. <laughs> a very great teenager who I love to death. So I, I, I don't know if they're a teenager now. Yeah, no. Uh, post -talk. I didn't see any ability to discuss the changes, the those micro changes. Uh, oh, like discuss a micro contribution? Yeah. I, I mean, I, this doesn't necessarily propose that that would be any different than it is now except for the addition of flow, which makes actually having discussions on Wikipedia not impossible. Um, sure, I mean, I would say everything Wikipedia is, but yes. Yeah, and that's that's what I was saying to the other question. Um, you know, we feel that there's probably going to be a spectrum of micro contributions. Some will be um, exactly equivalent to an edit. Now, um, you hit, you know, whatever the action is, you've saved it, it's done. Um, and other on the further spectrum of micro contributions, we can think about things uh, working in aggregate. Um, things like the the photo rating that you guys did, just did. We can say that they are themselves an edit. But that edit is not visible on the on the site immediately. They're improving a database, and that database is shown later to other editors. So I think a lot of these contributions are going to fall along the spectrum of some of them are going to function as individual edits, and some of them are going to function as improving a database or being aggregated together before an edit is made. Does that answer the question? Thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Just I'm curious. That What's the best way that academic researchers and the community at large can feed into the design process? That is a great question. Um, ask probably, <laughs> probably, uh, probably our talk page. Um, there's a design research talk page. That's a sub page of the design talk page. Um, so uh, I, I would say you know talk directly to the researchers. Um, you know they're going to be I, I would say they're going to be our main channel for having academic research kind of feed into what we're doing. Um, and Abby will be working to, you know, directly with our analytics team as well as, you know, external researchers to, to help us, you know, get the best learnings from what's going on in the world um, in forming our design process. And Abby's right here. <laughs> this is Abby. <laughs> Red hair, glasses, back of the room. <laughs> okay, yeah, there you go. Sorry, it's bright. How, how do you deal with the challenge of designing holistically? I mean, you, you could take 15 or, or 20 uh, features or interface elements and A/B test them, and find that if if you put all all the answers of those tests together, it's actually not the optimal combination. So we did this experiment where we had a hundred thousand shades of blue. <laughs> That's a different company. Sorry. Um, so uh, so we do. We do some testing, and with uh, the, the forming of the, the design research group, we'll be doing a lot more. Um, and like I said, we do this all the way through the process. Um, we do it from you know concept to paper prototypes to just us writing about things. Um, and then you know when we can, uh, some of the designers will build uh, prototypes that we can test with users, um, and we'll test like vastly different ideas. Um, Pow Jenner, one of our, our designers. Um, is working on a content translation tool, and he had you know some kind of very different ways that users could interact with it, and did a, um, a bunch of user testing around that, um, and then you know that informed his design um, that was shown to the engineers, to the product people in that group um, to help them make those decisions. Um, you know we we want to later balance the idea of using both quantitative and qualitative research to really you know kind of iteratively make designs better. Um, but because of the size of our organization and our design team and our research team, um, you know, we have to kind of decide when enough is enough and we have to move forward with something, knowing that we can always change it later. Um, but you know, you can be paralyzed by, by choice. 
um, and just you know keep iterating on something and never actually build something. So that's that's one of our biggest challenges. I think Stephen Walling either wants to ask a question or add something. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add on that. Like gen generally speaking, the foundation does an A B test in the kind of thing or of like a big multi-year A B test or B test ten and we're going to do something and each one has like a different button. But like generally like we just don't have time to kind of do that kind of thing. Generally speaking, we're testing to see if it's a new interface, positive and positive effect at all, you know, you know, on the first time on the side of the thing. So we don't we don't really test the kind of like regular so yeah, I would say that um, in addition to what Stephen said, you know, it's like we we do that, um, but not at the scale um, that a lot of other companies are able to do. And you know, we'd love to think of kind of cheap ways of doing that better. And you know, we're always coming up with new ways too. Anything else? Oh, sorry, I can't see. Yeah. My, my reaction regarding the easy interface uh, improvements or changes is that it makes teaching Wikipedia harder. I'm oh, sorry, again? Yeah, it makes teaching Wikipedia harder. For example, oh, teaching, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. For example, uh, I thought the idea of uh, the visual editor was a good idea. It makes editing easier. But actually, when it comes to teaching people how to edit, uh, the teacher or the lecturer has to learn a new interface in order to properly teach uh, the participants how to use uh, how to edit the media. So I think my, my uh, concern is uh, adding new interfaces in addition to the existing, existing interfaces may it will make yeah, teaching media harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And um, it, before, before joining the foundation, um, I worked at uh, a company called Autodesk, which makes um, a piece of software called AutoCAD. And it's, uh, AutoCAD is an extremely complex piece of software um, <laughs> that sometimes people go to, to school for years to learn. Um, and, and every year, we would make the software easier. Um, it would still do the same things. It would still be just as powerful, but it would be easier to use. It would be easier to learn. And, and we had this interesting um, feedback from a lot of our users, especially teachers people who wrote books, people who taught classes, um, that there, there was this hostility around you've, you've begun to invalidate what I've done. You've invalidated the fact that I spent you know, 10 years learning this, the fact that I spent a year writing a book about this, and now you've changed it. Now you've, you've kind of, they feel like you're slowly making their job unnecessary. And uh, I, think, I don't have a great answer for it. I, I would say that Yes, we do want to make their job unnecessary. We want to make it something you don't have to have a teacher to learn to do. Uh, we want it to be something as simple um, as a game. We want you to be able to feel confident that you can do it without seeking someone out. But we also want to make sure that there are those people that you can seek out and make it easier for them to help you if you ask for help. So. About flow specifically? Oh, uh, I mean, you. <laughs> uh, we, like I said, we've been rolling out beta features, and one of the other places you can test out flow is most beta feature talk pages are flow enabled right now. So you can actually see some real conversations happening about beta features. Um, if you go to the compact personal bar beta feature in the talk page, there you can see flow in action. Um, you know, I have you know three, four, five jobs at the foundation, and you know when I'm. PMing a beta feature in addition to everything else I do, um, you know, I, I was I was doing that for um, a, a feature that was using a talk page, and I was using it for a feature that was using a flow enabled page, and the amount of time spent for me to interact with the flow enabled project was a fraction of the amount of time it took me to enable with the talk page um, enabled talk well the wiki text talk page. Um, so I I love it. Um, I think it's got a lot of room to grow. Um, I think it's uh, it's not perfect, um, but I think it's in the right direction. And I think um, you know we have had comments from people interacting and giving feedback on beta features who have never talked on a talk page before. Um, and so we we know it's working in that regard. We know that people who are uncomfortable with talk pages or uncomfortable with Wikitext 
can't interact on flow <laughs> pages where they haven't been able to on top pages. And that's and that, that's frustrating. I know. I went to um, I went into a small editathon um, with a bunch of new users, and uh, and one of the things that that someone was saying is like, you know, you translated this article from another language, and so you should go and insert this translation template to say what the source language was. Um, and they tried to do it in Visual Editor, and and there was kind of a stumbling block. It, it, it might have been that it wasn't possible. It might have been they they just didn't know how to do it, um, and so they had to switch to Wikitext to kind of finish the lesson. Um, and I, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's friction anytime things are changing, um, and and that's it's. I think it's probably just inevitable that that happens. Um, but hopefully, you know, the end uh, will make it worth it. So I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. I think uh, this is also due to a paradigm shift in design and software development in the last decade. I think uh, before you had big books telling you the exact way to do something. And nowadays, uh, you have more the paradigm. There are many ways to the same solution. And it's important that you're always enabled to uh, shift between the ways. And that's what happened in the original editor in the first version. It wasn't possible that. Uh, yeah, and that's, like I said, that's that's being worked on now. It's, it's already vastly improved the ability to kind of seamlessly switch back and forth, and, and will continue to improve. So many ways aren't bad. Yeah, yeah, no, no, of course. More time to teach both ways. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any hands, and we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully this should work. And here's Brandon to talk about Athena. Wikimania, uh, Washington DC, I gave a talk called the Athena Project, Wikipedia in the year 2015, which was intended as a uh, sort of, a, I believe that I said at the time, a kick in the head, uh, because we wanted to break out of some boxes that we'd sort of walked ourselves into over the course of 10 years of, of design and, and uh, failure to design. Uh, so uh, it just seemed natural and right that I would uh, go ahead this year and give you an update and talk about where we are. Uh, in relation to that original thought process and road plan. Uh, and at the time, 2015 seemed very ambitious, and it still is. Here's the deal. Jared pretty much gave my talk already. So I'm just going to burn through these slides, and then we'll just start talking in questions. Uh, where are we? So first off, more Kirk, less Spock. This has been and will remain my design principle. Florida. <laughs> So, this is now. 
Agora, Athena, Echo, Flow, and Global Profile. If you see something here, unless I say otherwise, you should assume that it's not final. But guess what? Spoiler, there's final designs. So we'll start with Agora. In 2012, this is really just not the best way to do this. Um, in 2012, we described Agora as a design guide. We were going to talk about standardizing our visual principles across all the things. And we were going to actually do, you know, real design. Uh, so, uh, data driven. So we had uh, moved into 2014, and guess what? It's exactly the same. Uh, we're almost there. We're working on style guides. But as far as Agora as a project goes, nothing has changed. The timeline still stands. You can go and play with it right now, right there. Uh, these slides will be up later someplace. Any rate, blah, blah, blah. Athena, 2012. <laughs> I told you, I'm going to go through fast. Uh, we're going to rethink the interface. We're going to fix some basic flaws that have been there from the very beginning. For example, the uh, distinction between the content and the actions about the content being completely separated visually, uh, users being trained to ignore anything outside of the content box, which is where all the magic stuff happened, uh, and that we were going to attempt to modernize. Uh, and this is what it looked like at the time. This was a, a concept uh, that we were working on, me and, and Kyle Jenner at the time. A uh, lot of interesting stuff going on there. Didn't quite work out that way. Uh, we no longer have Athena, we have Winter. And we're going to talk all about that. Guess what? Same thing. This is Winter. Same word. We'll talk about that. That's where we're going. 2014, Winter. Here's some links. Fun. <laughs> Echo and flow. <laughs> ah, somebody gets this joke. Uh, Echo and Flow. In 2012, Echo and Flow, the design of Echo was about global cross wiki notifications. Um, and we had some really ambitious ideas for what this was going to be. Echo was and remains one of the fundamental underpinnings of the architecture for our, for our systems. Uh, unfortunately, you know, here's what it looked like then. Those are just some ideas. Unfortunately, we didn't get there. So, uh, the global cross wiki thing, which was near and dear to my heart, did not make it through the product cycle. Uh, and so at this point, Echo is still just local wiki. Um, that's a, kind of a sad thing, but hopefully we're going to fix that, especially since Flow is already cross wiki. Um, bet you didn't know that. Uh, we didn't get it built for publications. Um, we had sort of needed to like build another extension that was going to specifically like write these, these notifications. That hadn't happened yet. Uh, and it, it, it might, it's just by 2015, it's just not there yet. This is what Echo looks like today. It's real. You've clearly seen it. Let's move on. Flow in 2012. This is what it was. Structured user to user messaging. We're going to get rid of talk page problems, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in 2012, uh, this should say, you know, still 2012, I'm sorry, my slides. Uh, sortable, freshness indicators, all sorts and kinds of other things along those lines. This was sort of the idea. Notice the avatars that everybody hates. We love putting that in there, by the way, because it like gets you to focus on something that we don't care about as much. Uh, so that you, you miss all the other cool stuff that we can do you know, while you're complaining about that. <laughs> Misdirection is the, the best thing. In 2012, we are on target. Uh, it, Actually, flow got a lot bigger between 2012 and 2013. Uh, there was a whole thing that was my entire focus for like a year. Uh, we have a lots of experimental. There's a lot of stuff that is interesting and true. For example, it is cross wiki on day zero. Uh, you just don't see it because it's only on like one wiki, so it, that doesn't I mean, that's kind of a problem. Uh, we will, at the end of the year, have sortable conversations about all this other stuff. The only thing that's missing is that little thing at the bottom that we distracted you with, the avatars. Yeah, there you go. Here's what Flow looks like today.